So when I thought about what I could uh, organize on a moment's notice to talk about, I thought, well, it ought to be something that uh, I can easily speak extemporaneously about uh, without too much preparation. So uh, the first thing that came to mind was Franklin Merrill Wolf and his teachings. This is Franklin Merrill Wolf. Uh, I like to call him Dr. Wolf. He didn't actually get a PhD, but uh, he did go to graduate school for a while, and I think uh, his work after then deserves an honorary degree, even if no one gave him one, so it's good enough for me. Some of his students called him Yogi. Some just call him Franklin. Uh, but why am I talking about this fellow? Uh, well, on Joel's uh, spiritual path, he went around and uh, interviewed, visited various spiritual communities and visited different spiritual teachers. And one of the places he visited was Dr. Wolf's ranch where he was living at the time. And he was at quite an advanced age at that point. And he did a, a video interview with, with Dr. Wolf as he did with the other people. So here's a, a picture of Joel with <laughs> Dr. Wolf there. a little bit small there, and there's uh, Dr. Wolf during the interview. So th this is actually a clip of, uh, it's just a short, you know, one minute section of this video. This is actually the very end, and Joel asked Dr. Wolf uh, lots of questions throughout the video, and then at the very end he says, well, what advice would you have for a spiritual seeker? And Dr. Wolf, as you'll learn very soon, uh, was a real Janana yogi, and he was a real intellectual type. And, you know, you'd expect him to say something like, well, practice discrimination is taught by Shankara or something like that. But no, this is what he says uh, instead. I recommend the most honorable kind of life that you can live. in all human relationships. Um, to cultivate the attitude that the end is the triumph of good. Not my good, but good as such. I think that's a perfect ending. Thank you very much, Dr. Wolf. Thank you, Diane. Well, so it's really uh, uh, a practice of morality, or as we put it in the center's term, precepts. This is really uh, the foundation of a spiritual path in his mind is living uh, a, a moral life. And, and if you read Shankara, actually, he, uh, it's easy to skip over, but uh, in his book, The Crestule of Discrimination, before he launches into all of the, all of the philosophy and the practice of discrimination, he says, uh, these are the prerequisites, by the way, and da 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 and one of those is morality to practice precepts and so on. So um, Dr. Wolf's basically agreeing with... Uh, who he considered to be his guru. So Joel uh, conducted this interview, and Dr. Wolf had quite, a, quite an influence on Joel, so much so that uh, Joel came back uh, after he completed his spiritual quest and spent a year and a half at Dr. Wolf's ranch uh, writing his spiritual autobiography, Naked Through the Gate. <clears throat> Let me just share with you uh, what Joel wrote about his impressions of Wolf. This first passage I'll read is his impressions upon his first visit when he did the interview. He kind of gives a sketch of Dr. Wolf. He's this old man and so on. Um, and he gets these visitors and he lives way up in the mountains and all of this. And then he says uh, what the gist of what Joel got from Dr. Wolf was a kind of unspoken standard to be applied throughout the rest of my journey. As far as I could tell, Dr. Wolf was a genuine Gnostic. 
and yet he was also and proudly a product of Western culture. He wore Western-style clothes, spoke with a Western twang, and kept to the habits and customs of Western rural life, even to the point of refusing to set his clock by daylight savings time. (laughs) His table was laid with such traditional fare as fried chicken, potatoes and gravy, beans, apple pie, ice cream, and coffee. More importantly, although he had been heavily influenced by Eastern ideas, particularly those of the great Vedantic sage Shankara, His own thinking was a rich and purposeful grafting of Eastern concepts onto the preeminently rational branches of Western philosophy, whose roots could be traced back through Kant and Spinoza to Plato. It is true, he was fond of saying, that realization is beyond the grasp of the rational mind. But, he always added gravely, that does not make it irrational. In this man, East and West had met to the glory of both. So one of the things that really struck Joel was that Dr. Wolf was really this authentic and uh, deep, spiritually realized Westerner. And so that was a a great uh, exemplar, an example for Joel on its spiritual path, that this is possible and you don't need to go wear uh, Eastern robes and, and adopt the cultural uh, accoutrements of, of these Eastern traditions. And in the uh, epilogue to the book, uh, after he writes all about his spiritual path and its completion, uh, he's basically finished with his story, he, uh, he talks about kind of where things are going, looking forward to the future. And he again mentions uh, the influence of Dr. Wolf. And uh, this is important because it's influenced the whole center and what the center is and the whole approach the center has taken. Here's what Joel writes. The year in Lone Pine spent writing this book has proved fortuitous in more ways than one. The hush of the desert, the silence of the mountains, The luxury of simple living with not even a phone to interrupt concentration has provided, of course, an ideal setting for the accomplishment of this work. Far more importantly, however, I have been graced by the presence of the great wolf himself. Too advanced in age to impart extensive formal teachings, he nevertheless has exercised a profound influence on my whole subsequent development. To begin with, there are his own writings, Pathways Through to Space, The Philosophy of Consciousness Without an Object, and Interceptualism, in which he calls philosophy back to its ancient and original task of being a way of realization and not solely a monitor of doing. Secondly, he's guided me back to that most precious of human inheritances, the world's great mystical classics, where in the records of Shankara and Mirabai, of Rumi and Arabi, Teresa and Dionysius, Nagarjuna and Lady Zeugel, to name a few, I found maps and journals describing the very same terrain I had traversed. Indeed, almost every incident of my own journey had antecedents in the journeys of others. And then he goes on to mention some of the parallels um, that he found there. So one of the centers missions is to demonstrate that all the mystics and all the different traditions speak of the same universal truth. And you can see that this mission of the center has its seeds in this influence uh, from Dr. Wolf here. You can definitely find uh, influence there, especially in the five fundamentals. Uh, We'll actually get to Wolf's fundamentals and you'll see the first fundamental of Wolf's philosophy is almost identical to the first fundamental of the center's uh, teachings. So uh, so after Joel wrote his book, he lived in L.A. for a while and then was uh, recruited to come up here by Amit Goswami, uh, professor of physics at the time at the university, who uh, w- was looking for a spiritual teacher and knew Dr. Wolf, and, uh, but Dr. Wolf was too old and actually uh, he died in 1985, so... 
uh, at that time, uh, he wasn't even living anymore, and uh, Amit wanted a living uh, guru. <laughs> so uh, even though Joel knew nothing about being a guru, he said, okay. Uh, so <laughs> he moved up to Eugene, and uh, they basically started the center in 1987. And his first retreat that Joel gave was at Wolf's uh, property at the ranch in, 19, in the summer of 1987. And um, there we are. There's uh, Joel and Andrea, some of you know, and uh, Sydney uh, and uh, Amit and his wife at the time, Maggie, and there's, there I am, uh, probably 22 at the time. Uh, so, uh, yeah, they were generous enough to invite me along on this trip. It was, uh, I had just recently uh, met Joel and Amit and Maggie, and um, uh, Maggie lent me a copy of Pathways Through to Space, and that was it. Uh, I had to go. Yeah, I was a student of physics at the time, and I was very much interested in the philosophy of physics and the interpretation of quantum theory and all of that. And, Amit was also, and he was giving a seminar at the university that I attended. And at the end of the seminar, he, there were like three of us, I think. Uh, he said, well, why don't you all come over to my house for dinner? I want you to meet this mystic that's living with me. And Amit's this Indian guy, and so I expected some swami with a turban and all of this. And <laughs> so I come in, in the door. My first shock is Maggie, you know, I, stereotypes, you know. You know I, this very blonde woman, uh, uh, sort of the mirror, mirror image of what I was expecting, you know. Uh, and, then, uh, and then I'm like, well, where's the mystic? And here's, you know, Joel smoking a cigarette and <laughs> drinking a beer. And <clears throat> so, uh, so much for uh, all of my expectations and stereotypes, right? So, uh, so here's another one of Joel's retreats up there at, at Dr. Wolf's ranch the next year. So this uh, this drew uh, more people from Oregon, and that's Jennifer with short hair, uh, young Jennifer, and Amit's there, and uh, Joel, and that's June 1988. Yeah, so that was the next summer, um, and then he's continued to go up there uh, on a regular basis. Uh, Andrea lived there. Uh, she's not actually uh, in the area right now, uh, but uh, she invited Joel down to teach some of her students there on retreats, and so they would go up to Dr. Wolf's ranch. And this is a picture of him teaching in Dr. Wolf's uh, living room. I don't know if you remember uh, the video, but this is the same chair, and and that's the clock you heard behind him. And so they basically keep his house as it was. Uh, Pretty much. Yeah, and his library is still there with all of his philosophy books on the shelves. And, and that's the setting. You can see the mountains there. This is the eastern slope of the Sierra Nevada. And uh, the house is kind of in those trees there up the road. So it's quite a dramatic, uh, spectacular place to be. Uh, and uh, in addition to Joel going up there uh, and giving teachings. There also, uh, every summer, there's a, a convention or conference of Dr. Wolf students. And uh, of course, Dr. Wolf isn't there anymore uh, to lead these. But uh, there are still gatherings that are centered around his teaching and philosophy. Um, and I've been to quite a number of those. This is the one last summer that I attended. And there's Dorothy. Uh, and there's Ron Leonard. I'll talk more about him in a minute. A couple of Dorothy's daughters and uh, some other people. They're, lately, they've been pretty intimate gatherings. Years ago, there were you know, 50 people that would come. But uh, recent years, they've been smaller gatherings. So that's sort of the connection with the center uh, and why I'm talking about Dr. Wolf at all, because uh, we do have kind of a special relationship with him uh, at the center uh, as compared to other teachers in the world. So let's talk a little bit about Wolf himself. He lived a very long life, 98 years. He was born in 1887. And uh, this is a picture of his graduation from Stanford in 1911. 
That was a while ago. And if you read his books, it kind of shows in his writing that you know it's sort of a, this Victorian style uh, uh, writing, and um, he it kind of stuck with him throughout his life especially as, as he was older, the generation gap. You know, it was a multi-generation gap uh, oh, yeah. as, he was, as he was older. So uh, at Stanford, he studied, he majored in mathematics, but he also minored in philosophy and psychology. And mathematics was, uh, he was very talented in mathematics, and uh, so much so that they invited him later to come teach at Stanford, and he actually taught there for a year in mathematics. But he was really drawn more uh, to philosophy. Even though he really loved uh, mathematics, he, he found in mathematics a kind of truth and certainty that you don't find in other areas of life so much. Everything else is so unstable and uncertain. But in mathematics, he was finding this kind of rock-solid certainty. But he, he really wanted to find a kind of certainty even beyond that. And that drew him to philosophy. And he studied uh, in his later years at Stanford, he studied some of uh, Immanuel Kant's philosophy. And in his year at Harvard, uh, he also studied more of Immanuel Kant and was even more impressed with it. And it really influenced him and in addition to that, he had been exposed to some uh, Eastern philosophies at that point, some Hinduism and Buddhism and theosophy. And he had become convinced that there was something beyond what we can know just with our thinking mind and our sensory experience. There was some kind of knowledge. We might call it spiritual knowledge or gnosis or something like that, something some kind of certainty that was beyond what could be attained by the rational mind. And he knew that he couldn't find it within traditional Western academic studies and circles and teachings and so on. So after this year at Harvard, he came back to Stanford, taught mathematics for a year, and said, I need to just focus completely on this spiritual quest, basically. So he left what was probably going to be a very promising career in academia for this spiritual quest. Um, and he was uh, influenced during this period by, I mentioned theosophy. He uh, attended some theosophy uh, groups and uh, was part of a community that was centered around theosophical teachings. And then after that, he was associated for a while with uh, some Sufi organizations, one that was uh, initiated by uh, Hazrat Inyat Khan. He came over in the 20s for a little while in the U.S. and started this uh, international uh, Sufi movement. And, uh, and then after that, uh, he was affiliated with uh, a Hindu group. A, uh, a yogi came over from India who was, I think, an initiate in Kriya Yoga and he established a group and then went back to India. And, uh, but uh, Franklin was affiliated with that for a while and was influenced by that. And this was one of the outfits he wore uh, when uh, he was uh, doing some teaching. Um, and then he, uh, he had met uh, his wife, uh, Sharifa, uh, when they were uh, affiliated with one of the theosophical uh, groups. And uh, they were married, and she had some children by a previous marriage that they uh, raised. And um, they ended up starting their own group after this uh, and called the Assembly of Man. And they bought this property near Lone Pine, and they started uh, constructing an ashram up in the mountains and uh, kind of had their own uh, teaching at that point. That was in the 20s, the late 20s, I believe, early 30s. So in the 70s, some of these uh, you know, flower children and people would come up to visit Dr. Wolf, and someone had, them, had this one young woman on tape, and, and her comment was uh, about Dr. Wolf and his students, who were very advanced in age at this point. She said, these people have been doing this for a long time. <laughs> 
like this is this isn't not anything new, you know. <clears throat> so they were kind of you know on this cutting edge, as it were. Um, and then in 1936, uh, he had his awakening, his enlightenment, what he called recognition or realization. Uh, he actually had several, um, some which he called uh, preparatory or premonitory, and then others he called fundamental or transcendental, a couple of those, and we'll talk about those later. <clears throat> so this is him in 1936, and then um, he basically spent the rest of his years uh, teaching and traveling around lecturing and writing books, and, uh, and then in his, in his retirement, he, uh, he built a house up near the ashram, and he lived there and recorded hundreds of hours of audio taped talks, uh, some prepared, some extemporaneous. Uh, so there's lots of material there. Uh, and this is him. I'm not sure exactly, but that's probably right near the end of his life there. Um, so here's, here's a picture of the ashram. It's quite a dramatic setting. And he went up there with donkeys and dynamite, and they blew these granite rocks out of the side of this mountain and cemented them together, and they built this, uh, this ashram up there. And they would go up there with students in the summer and work on the ashram and camp out and have their meetings and spiritual retreats, basically, in the mountains. Yeah, in the 30s. and So uh, that's the way it used to be done. Uh, here's a, a picture from a little further away. You can see more of the mountains there in the background. Is the ashram still there? It's still there, yeah. It's uh, kind of in a, it's a very, basically just the, the granite structures there. Um, the roof keeps getting damaged by the weather and elements, and so occasionally people go up and patch it up. So, but yeah, it's still there, and uh, people frequently hike up to it. So let's move on now more to Franklin's uh, philosophy and his teaching, which he considered uh, the most important aspect of his legacy. He didn't want to start a religion or uh, become some uh, object of uh, worship or anything like that. His, what he felt was his main contribution was his philosophy, and his philosophy he considered to be a spiritual teaching. Before kind of his real spiritual path started, one of his main influences was Immanuel Kant, and in particular his book, The Critique of Pure Reason. And Kant was really a seminal figure in Western philosophy. And uh, Dr. Wolff's kind of described it as uh, a bridge from Western to Eastern philosophy um, that allowed him to make this transition. And in particular, Kant's idea of the transcendental unity of apperception is what he calls it. It's quite a mouthful. Um, but basically, it's the pure subject of awareness, the subjectivity or awareness in its naked, pure sense, uh, with just that principle itself of being aware. And Kant had this highfalutin term for it, but that's what we call it. And here's just a passage of Kant to give you a sense that Here's a Western philosopher who actually realizes that there's something like this uh, that can play a philosophical role. So Kant says, there can be in us no modes of knowledge, no connection or unity of one mode of knowledge with another without that unity of consciousness which precedes all data of intuitions and by relation to which representations of objects is alone possible. This pure, original, unchangeable consciousness I shall name transcendental apperception. So this is really this fundamental awareness that's at the root of all other kinds of knowledge that makes everything else possible. All kinds of uh, perceptions and cognitions, and none of it would be possible without this as the ground. And so here's a Western philosopher who kind of has this idea and provides this bridge. He doesn't give any spiritual practices in his book, but philosophically, he provides this bridge for someone like Dr. Wolf, who's very philosophically minded. 
he was exposed, as I said, to lots of different spiritual teachings, uh, theosophy, Sufism, uh, these yogic teachings from Kriya Yoga. But uh, for his temperament, uh, which was very intellectual, there was a, a limit to what these could do for him. That He had uh, intellectual concerns that weren't addressed. So he needed a more philosophical kind of teaching. And the only Eastern teacher that he found at the time that addressed this for him was Shankara. And he found such a connection with Shankara that he even called him his guru. He felt this kind of inner rapport with what Shankara would write, where he would read Shankara and it would start to have these uh, effects on him, where it would almost induce him into altered states of consciousness. And so he considered Shankara very significant for him, so much so that it was while reading Shankara that he became enlightened. Um, or I should say just after reading Shankara. He read uh, this book, The System of the Vedanta. Uh, I'm not sure how long he had had this book, but he took it with him uh, on a mining expedition he took. He was uh, a gold miner, and in addition to being an a orange uh, farmer down in Southern California, and so on one of his uh, trips uh, where he was doing some mining, he would also read philosophy uh, and uh, meditate. This is a, a book by uh, a Western uh, philosopher named Paul Doyson. And it's a treatment of Shankara's work. And so there are lots of quotes of Shankara in here with kind of some commentary, uh, interpretive commentary on it. And... Uh, and so Dr. Wolf describes that one evening he was particularly drawn to uh, just open it up and read the chapter on liberation, which understandably is near the end. Uh, and, uh, and he says he read it, and it was all intellectually very clear to him, and then it sparked an insight that he was mistaking, uh, he was making this mistake all along that he was looking for some change, some other experience, something different to happen. He was looking for something else, something other than what already was the case. And when he realized this with sufficient profundity, he right there just dropped all of his effort to seek any more. He, he really got it at that point that you couldn't get it <laughs> right, by any effort. And then, as he described it, the heavens opened. So um, there's uh, this whole chapter here. I wouldn't want to read the whole thing to you, but here's a little excerpt of what Franklin read that day. So maybe... Uh, could have an effect on you as well. We here perceive most clearly the impossibility of attaining liberation by any effort on our part. True, liberation consists only in knowledge, with a capital K, but in knowledge of a special kind in that there is no question of an object which investigation could discover and contemplate but only of that which can never be an object, because in every cognition it is the subject of cognition. So you also kind of see here the connection with Kant also. Kant was also talking about this, that which is presupposed in all cognition, in all kinds of knowledge. It's the ground of everything. So that was uh, what did it for him. And then after his awakening, he kept a journal for several months, and that became a book called Pathways Through to Space. Because of his nature, there are parts of it that are philosophical, but he also has uh, discussions that are more psychological, uh, discussions that have to do with morality and more kind of political questions, and there's also some poetry and this actually was a surprise even to him, that he started spontaneously writing poetry. 
he was this kind of very mathematical person, you know, very analytical and everything. And suddenly he's writing this poetry. And uh, so that was one of the things that uh, changed for him was that uh, things started becoming more spontaneous for him and expressing themselves through him, as it were. He also wrote uh, a sequel to that. This is more of a systematic treatment of uh, his view, his philosophy, based on his realization, um, the philosophy of consciousness without an object. And if that isn't rigorous enough for you, he wrote another book, <laughs> Interceptualism which is really geared towards academics. So if you really want the, the hardcore meat to it. And one of the academics that uh, has studied Dr. Wolf is Ron Leonard. And he, to my knowledge, is the only, <clears throat> the only person who has ever uh, had Dr. Wolf as the subject of their PhD dissertation. There's Ron last summer. And... Uh, this is his, uh, his dissertation uh, became a book called The Transcendental Philosophy of Franklin Merrill Wolf. And after publishing this, he also went on to uh, edit and republish uh, Franklin's works, which were out of print. So he brought them back in print and got them published by SUNY Press, State University of New York, which is an academic publisher. So that was uh, impressive that they would take that on. Here are these uh, republications of Dr. Wolf's books. This contains the two pathways through to space and philosophy of consciousness without an object, and this has the interceptualism in it. One of his purposes was to get Dr. Wolf's books back in print, but another was to provide some interpretation and context to hopefully uh, provide a bridge between Franklin's work and kind of modern philosophy. Uh, a lot had changed since 1911, <laughs> 1912, when Franklin studied philosophy in academia and then left. A lot has changed until the you know, 70s and 80s when Ron was studying. And so he wanted to kind of bring Franklin's uh, philosophy kind of into the, the late 20th century and early 21st century so that maybe he can become better known. Um, so let's uh, roll up our sleeves now and get to uh, Wolf's realizations themselves. So this is, uh, I'm going to open the books and actually read his philosophy now instead of just talking about it and him. Along his path, he, I already mentioned he had these uh, preliminary recognitions. And these are what we call maybe Gnostic flashes or or uh, deep insights, and um, these are these were sufficiently profound that they had a lasting effect on his thinking and his personality, and uh, and his all, whole way of looking at life, and um, as opposed to just kind of an oh that was a cool idea, and then you kind of you go on with your life, right? Um, but they weren't uh, yet to the level of being a full-blown awakening or a shift of his identity to uh, consciousness itself. So the first one uh, he called I am Atman, and this is really the precursor of his, his awakening. So he realized this, uh, this was kind of a hint of what was, what was to come. He realized that his his deepest and truest self wasn't a body, it wasn't his uh, emotions, it wasn't his thinking. And this w was born of uh, practicing Shankara's teaching of discrimination. And the key to that is first recognizing that Shankara's uh, teaching of what the Atman is, is that it's this reality, this pure subjectivity, this pure consciousness that is at the ground of all experience. And and then second, disidentifying oneself with all these transient things that come and go, all of our thoughts, all of our sensations and everything, to the point where uh, our identity can actually shift from being identified with a limited ego in a body limited by space and time to consciousness itself. So he had a, it, it wasn't a full-blown awakening, but it was a, a deep insight into the truth of this, and it had this profound effect on him. 
And then he had what he called this realization of I am nirvana. And nirvana was more, it was essentially the same thing uh, as, as the, the Atman, except it's more uh, objective in the sense that nirvana is the place where you go <laughs> when you realize this, right? It's this, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in this other state. I'm going to be in this other world. It's not going to be this, right? And so his realization was that, oh, well, it's already here. I am. That actually is the essence of what is already here. And so I am already that. Uh, and so this was, uh, again, setting the ground for a more profound realization of this later. And so he realized this at a very deep, uh, at a very deep level, but it wasn't. So there are these two poles, and one is, you know, realizing that, uh, well, already my innermost essence is this fundamental ground, but then there's also kind of the, the, what am I, but I haven't realized that, so I objectify it, you know, and I call that nirvana. And so there are these two different things. And so when you realize I am Atman and I am nirvana, well, then Atman is nirvana, right? So the, so a lot of this is clarifying some of these concepts. You know, he studied philosophy and he he developed a conceptual understanding of these things. But then that has to deepen, and you have to let go of, oh, I understand, you know, what Atman is, or I understand what Nirvana is. It has to go beyond that, where there's a, a an insight that goes beyond thinking. So he had these deep insights, but it wasn't quite enough to shift his identity yet. He has a somewhat uh, unique use of some of these terms, uh, so they don't always conform with uh, with what the traditions, the way that various traditions might use them. Um, you find it with consciousness as well. He uses consciousness as kind of the ultimate reality, whereas in Buddhism, for example, they tend to use awareness or, or some other term, and consciousness is more often used to describe subject-object kind of awareness. So right before his, his awakening, his realization, he had this other insight. And you could talk for a whole hour just about this. In fact, I have. But uh, <laughs> you can watch it online. <laughs> but, uh, and he, he put it in, in these terms. Uh, substantiality is inversely proportional to ponderability. Or reality is inversely proportional to appearance. Basically, the gist of that is that, and this is why some people find it hard to, to get into reading Dr. Wolf. Is that he uses these words in these uh, ways, and also he speaks in kind of this slightly antiquated way. But basically what he's getting at here is that the re reality is closer in a certain sense, to what is intangible than to what is tangible. So the more you know, hard and tangible something seems, actually the less real it is. And the more intangible and ethereal something seems, the more real it is. So something like consciousness, well, you know, you can't grab onto consciousness, right? You can't knock on it. You can't say what color it is. You can't really give it any attributes. It's, what can you say about it? It's, in that sense, it's, it's intangible, right? Completely intangible. And that's the most real. Whereas uh, the things we experience are less tangible. And they're less, tang they're, they're less real. And less real in the sense that they veil that, their distractions from that. If you have a sense of what pure consciousness is, just the bare fact of being aware, the more you're aware of, of some object like this, the more that awareness is going to be veiled or obscured to some extent. So, Because you're focusing on this thing that supposedly exists that isn't consciousness. That's the way we're, we habitually think of something like this. It's some object out there, and it's made of matter, right? So the, the more uh, our attention uh, conceives of things like this as being existing outside of consciousness, the more consciousness is being veiled, and the farther we are away from that reality. So in that sense, uh, 
these ponderable things, these things we can ponder, are taking us away from reality. They're, they're less real. In, in a real experiential way, it's not just some philosophical idea. It's that when you actually are experiencing something in that way, it's distracting you from experiencing pure consciousness as such. So that's, you know, uh, an hour talk in two minutes. <laughs> um, so his big, his big breakthrough was uh, really the, the, the realization that he is this fundamental reality of consciousness, of pure consciousness, and, and so is everything else. And uh, all the mystics have talked about this. I won't belabor the point. But uh, he then had this, what he called a second realization. And it surprised him. Um, but one way to look at it is that when he had this breakthrough, there was a subtle uh, tension between his previous 49 years of life, which were oriented objectively to the objective world and his uh, supposedly separate self, that experience of worldly life and, and samsara, you might say, and this breakthrough. Now he's you know, in nirvana, right? He's realized this, uh, and, so, and there's this huge contrast uh, for him and there was still the subtle tension between the two where he, uh, there was incredible bliss associated with the, his realization. And Joel describes this in his book as well. And so there was a subtle aversion to the experience of suffering and of the world, of bondage and so on and so forth. Uh, you, know, you don't want to go back to that, right? Uh, hold that thought. Um, so that was a duality. And when that duality broke down and was surrendered, he had what he called the high indifference, not a low indifference where you just don't care what happens. or But this was a high indifference in the sense that it was totally neutral with regard to both liberation and bondage. And he expresses this in his aphorisms, which we'll get to in a bit as well. So here are the three fundamentals of his philosophy. This is a little bit more formally uh, expressed. Number one, consciousness is original, self-existent, and constitutive of all things. This is very close to the center's first fundamental of consciousness alone is absolutely real, right? basically saying, that's it, that's the ground of reality. And it's, it's self-existent in the sense that it doesn't depend on anything else to exist. It's the ground. And it's constitutive of all things. So everything else is not apart from consciousness. They are consciousness. There is nothing else. Uh, his second fundamental is that the subject to consciousness transcends the object to consciousness. This is, uh, in terms of a teaching, this is meant to uh, reorient us. It's also a, a kind of expression of this substantiality as inversely proportional to ponderability idea. It's the, it's the idea that what is less tangible, the subjective consciousness, is more real than what is concrete and tangible. Um, objects. Uh, but the fact that it transcends them also means that objects come and go, but the consciousness is this invariant. It's, it uh, transcends them. It's more fundamental. Uh, and then finally, uh, there are three, not two, organs of knowledge, perception, conception, and interception. Interception is his word for this other kind of knowledge. Well, one way to explain it is you, you can know uh, perceptual <coughs> objects through your five senses of sight, hearing, touch, and so forth. You know these perceptual objects, and this is the basis of uh, a lot of our lives and what we know about the world. And then there's 
conceptual knowledge, which you know is involved in mathematics and so on and, and philosophy and and you put these together and you get things like science which which involve both mathematics and experiments with the world and and that's basically it as far as what most of Western philosophy recognizes and so what he's saying is that there's a third way of knowing and that's this fundamental knowledge of consciousness itself and he called it sometimes knowledge through identity because consciousness doesn't know itself as some object it knows itself by being itself it is conscious conscious means to know so it's just this knowingness that's inherent in awareness or consciousness if you think about it if you recognize that you're conscious right now or that there is consciousness or awareness how do you know that is that a perception is that some thing you perceive is it a sight is it a sound is it a no it's none of those things just the fact that you're conscious isn't any particular perception because all those perceptions could go away and you could still realize that there is consciousness or awareness so you don't know it through perception do you know it through conception well it's not uh it's not like the result of some deduction uh you don't uh, need to think in order to generate consciousness uh because we can sometimes find ourselves not thinking for at least a moment or two uh and there's still awareness or consciousness right and so what is it that is knowing that we are conscious how do we know that how do we know that we're conscious it's not perception it's not conception it's what he would call interception or just consciousness knowing consciousness it's just that simple so his aphorisms uh these are these pithy uh kind of philosophical statements that uh in addition to his more discursive writing and his in his books he has these aphorisms which he considers as seeds for meditation and so these are things that uh that one could read and then meditate upon and perhaps uh they may have a kind of uh transformative effect they also express his philosophy so i'm not going to read you all of the aphorisms there are 50 or so but i'll read a few of them here uh and i'll just go through them slowly uh without uh, elaborating upon them so maybe just relax and put yourself in a receptive mode and let's just uh listen to these aphorisms consciousness without an object is before objects were consciousness without an object is though objects seem to exist consciousness without an object is when objects vanish yet remaining through all unaffected consciousness without an object is outside of consciousness without an object nothing is when consciousness is attached to objects it is restricted through the forms imposed by the world containing space by time and by law when consciousness is disengaged from objects liberation from the forms of the world containing space of time and of law is attained attachment to objects is consciousness bound within the universe 
Liberation from such attachment is the state of unlimited nirvanic freedom. But consciousness without an object is neither bondage nor freedom. Beside the great space, there is none other. The great space is one of his terms for this absolute reality. So you might have noticed some reflection of his fundamentals of his philosophy in those aphorisms. And in particular, there was the one where he said it's neither bondage nor freedom. And that was an expression of this insight of the high indifference. And if you read uh, Joel's book, at the end he also describes that after his gnosis there was this bliss and uh, he had these thoughts of, oh, maybe I'll just go off and uh, just live the rest of my life in this bliss. And then he realized, well, that's this grasping, right? And so in a certain sense it wasn't as dramatic for Joel, but he also had this similar kind of insight that there's this kind of final temptation. In the, in the, in the Hindu, they call this the, the last sheath, is the sheath of bliss that one has to detach from before there's ultimate liberation. This high indifference is a, a renunciation of this attachment, basically, to what Wolf would call nirvana or bliss and a... And a aversion to the world of suffering. One of the things that helped him resist that temptation was the bodhisattva vow. That is a vow to forego personal enlightenment or salvation uh, until all beings are saved. And uh, Joel talks about this as well in in his book and explains it if you want to go read it over. But the the gist of it is, is that this is that last temptation and the bodhisattva vow is really can be seen as, as, a, as a guard against that attachment, that final attachment to, to have this vow to always kind of uh, embrace suffering rather than try to escape to this nirvanic bliss. If you're stuck in emptiness, as the Buddhists say, no one can save you. So it's sort of this last temptation. So that's all I prepared for today. Uh, are there any questions or comments uh, here? Yeah. Thanks, Tom. That was wonderful. Um, Thank you. I wondered, or I was a little bit puzzled by the inclusion of the word law with space, time, and law, and I couldn't figure out what the reference to that was. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, the Buddhists might call that causality, or um, basically it's the, the kind of orderliness uh, uh, or uh, structure of, of experience that makes things, uh, that makes experience have regularity and repeatability and, and so on. Philosophy of Kant, you can, if you know it, you can see it influencing him in a lot of ways uh, that aren't directly obvious. But um, Kant uh, regards space and time as these two fundamental um, organizing principles that are really required for us to even have experience, uh, empirical experience. So uh, without uh, a notion of space, there couldn't be separate places for things to be without a notion of time. Uh, you couldn't have any changes happening. And so space and time are what Kant called the necessary preconditions for even the possibility of experience. So, uh, and, and so he's referring to that idea here, that, that space and time... And law is, is sort of the structure that, that, that objects have within space and time, the relationships they have with each other. There's a kind of orderliness to that. 
or lawfulness to that. Oh, he has a yeah. Good thing. Right. Yeah, and those those structures of space and time and law, those form the um, the basis of our objective world of experience. That once there's a belief that that is has an independent reality to it, uh, then we're in bondage. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm I'm up being led through that. Um, what what is the what would you recommend as a book to start to you know get a little bit of that? Would you think Pathways Through to Space would be a good one to start with? Yeah. That's where I started. Um, it's a it's great for a great place to start for several reasons. One is it's um, it uh, gives you a sense of him as a person because this is a journal. It it, um, it he's kind of telling his story. He's and he's also uh, describing his insights uh, when they're fresh while they're happening to him, pretty much. Uh, and there's this poetry interspersed with it, and it's not uh, too overly philosophic and all of that. If you're, um, I'm making assumptions here, by the way, that you're not an academic philosopher who's looking for a rigorous treatment of <laughs> transcendental <laughs> consciousness, in which case I would say read interceptualism. Um, so uh, w w except for someone like that, I would say just start with Pathways. He was uh, 49 when he had his uh, awakening, and then he, well, he was writing that as it was happening. So, yeah, he was 49 when he wrote that. Um, and then uh, the philosophy of consciousness without an object was in the years that followed. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it, yes? We all move through life forced put our attentions on objects mm. that veils consciousness and ignorance is born. Let me try and illustrate it with the gong again. Um, uh, let me see if I can uh, give you a sense of this. So uh, if you start just by uh, relaxing attention back into just the, the fact of consciousness and awareness, and then from that, focus on an object. And then release that focus. The, there's a sense in which that is momentarily veiled while this focus is on the object, right? On the other hand, there's a sense in which uh, you know that you weren't unconscious. It, you know that uh, consciousness didn't disappear while you were focused on this, right? There was still awareness. There was still consciousness. It still existed. The, that fact was still true, that there was consciousness, even though you were focused. So it, it's like, even though it's, it's in the background, as it were, it isn't gone. It, it's not that it isn't there. So it's, you might say, uh, eclipsed partly. And to the extent that that other part is uh, known, and not in, a, in, a, in the sense of focusing on it known, but uh, recognized that it, it hasn't disappeared and we're kind of grounded in that, then it's no problem to be focused on something or not. They come and go, you know, being focused, you know, intently it comes and goes. But the, as when identity is shifted, you know, it's you, you can't lose or not become what you are. So there. But if if one is objectifying that that pure consciousness, oh, you know, well, wait, now I've lost it. I'm over here, you know, and oh, now, you know, then you're sort of torn between two things, right? But if, the more one is is identified and grounded in that reality, it's not a problem. Things arise, we focus on them, things vanish. You know. Does that help? 
Okay. It reminds me of um, that, this one saying, doobie, doobie, doobie. <laughs> <laughs> no. Great. It feels great. Thank you.